So good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Steve Glassy. I'm part of the GADMAC organising committee. Uh, and uh, this ses session, I am uh, pleased to uh, welcome you to uh, a presentation entitled Animal Transport Disasters, Queen Hind Sheep Rescue in Romania by Jackson Z from Four Paws International and a video, Rasu, uh, who's based in Romania. Um, in terms of our, if you're looking for their bios and abstracts for their presentations, just head to our website and under speakers, you'll find their bio and their abstracts. Uh, just in terms of general housekeeping, as we um, head through for this evening, you'll notice that the Zoom feature has been disabled. We welcome you to uh, provide any questions you have using the Q&A box at any stage during the presentation, and we'll come back to those towards the end. Uh, when you leave today's presentation, you'll also be invited to complete a short survey, uh, and we encourage you to do that for us. Just a reminder that uh, today's session, as with all the GADMAC sessions, they are being recorded. However, they will be uh, edited and made available later in July as part of the GADMAC Awards Ceremony. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jackson Z from Four Paws and Dr. Avidio Rasu uh, from uh, Aka. So, over to you, Jackson. Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, GADMAC, for inviting us to participate in this conference. Um, so I'm just going to uh, turn off my video so we can go right to the presentation. Um, we'll turn the back, we'll turn the video back on um, at the end. Um, so. Um, Today we'll be speaking about the animal transport disasters, specifically about the Queen Hind um, sheep rescue in Romania, which um, happened in 2000, the end of 2019. So a um, little bit about myself. I am Jackson Z. I am the director of the Disaster Relief Unit with Four Paws International based in Vienna, Austria. Um, today I'll be presenting with Dr. Ovidio Roshu of ARCA. Um, today's presentation, um, just a fair warning, um, there are graphic images of animal suffering. Um, if these images are disturbing, please turn off your display. Um, we can't avoid this, unfortunately. But um, we'll just begin now. <clears throat> um, so it was the 24th of November, 2019. Um, it was discovered that the livestock carrier vessel, the Queen Hind, ran aground in Constanta at the port of Medea. Uh, off the coast of Romania, initially reported with over 14,000 live sheep aboard. Local authorities were, of course, reluctant to act at first, uh, first, it was the, you know, uh, OVD will go into a lot more detail, but basically, first it was getting permission, and then it was getting help, <laughs> and it took a long time. Um, the team was able to really uh, do a fantastic job, um, and having professional equipment and being able to um, work with the uh, the fire service as well as with uh, emergency management to uh, get manpower and get um, access granted so they can do their job. Now, first of all, let's talk about the location. <laughs> Here's a small map. This is Romania, there's Bulgaria, this is um, part of Europe. Um, on the north side, you can see Odessa um, and other places. In the south of, on the map on the, on my right, on my left, um, you should see on the bottom of that, you'll see Istanbul, so that's Turkey. Um, but where the big arrow is pointing at Konstanta um, on the map on the left. Uh, on the right, you'll see a 
up close version of that. Um, there's the city of Costanta, there's the port, um, and the little sort of red star is kind of where the ship was, um, where it ran aground. Um, it wasn't very far. You can hear and see from shore, but it was not accessible by foot, and um, you were not allowed out into that area. Um, the sheep mostly ram, believe it or not. Um, we're supposed to face a three-week live animal transport. A three-week live animal transport in close confines um, without adequate care to the Middle East. Um, so you, on the map, on the, as you can see on the map, uh, on the right, so as you can tell, my left and my right are not distinctive for me since I'm, uh, I, I use both sides. <laughs> Um, so I get a little bit confused, but you can see in the map that from Romania, from the coast, it goes through the Bosphorus in Istanbul, then goes through the Aegean, across the Mediterranean, and down through the Suez to get down to the Middle East. Um, so this is a very long journey. Um, there's limited food and water um, on these transports. There's a lot of animals on these transports. The ambient temperature in the Middle East during transports can be up to 41 or degrees or more, um, as, as have been recorded. Um, and these are enclosed vessels um, with some gaps, but really they're quite enclosed. You'll see in the images later. Um, some of these animals we discovered were already pregnant, um, gravid, and um, they would have birthed during the transport. Um, so we have a bunch of small lambs with us that are now grown, um, but these are the things that we've learned in the last year. So a little bit about the Queen Hind. Um, here's the vessel in its when it was when it was better. Um, it was built in 1980. Um, it's considered a very old ship. Uh, it's 85 meters in length. Um, gross tonnage, the information's right there. This ship applied for access to the port in Spain, was denied. Um, and then it applied to Romania and it was accepted. So interesting thing there. This, this ship does fly under the flag of Palau. So that means all the rules pertaining to the ship fall under the rules from Palau. Okay. So a little more about the Queen Hind. Now you can see on the day that it ran aground. Um, so you can see it from port. So the photo on the left lower part of the screen, and that's what you see. That's the ship. It hit a sandbar. Um, and for anybody to approach the ship for safety reasons, they had to have a tug with the platform. Um, next to the ship and allow it to light. And you can see the buoys there to allow the other ships to know to move around. Um, the platform allowed us to have a working area. Um, the registered blueprints for the Queen Hind did not match the actual ship and caused challenges for the salvage company um, after the carcasses and the live animals were removed. And I can just discuss more of that later on. Um, I think what everybody's really interested in is the actual rescue. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Roshu. Um, he is a veterinarian and a PhD. Um, he works for a wonderful organization called ARCA, Animal Rescue um, and Care Association. And he's a first responder trained through the four-paw system. So um, over to you, if you're ready. Uh, thank you, Jackson. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening and good morning in Romania. Um, so, um, what I'm going to tell you and what you're going to see is going to be one of the most uh, terrifying experiences that my person, my, my personal, has ever seen. But in the same time, I think it is a little bit of hope because we have tried everything we could to do something good about this uh, situation. Um, Okay, first of all, you have to see a little bit the perspective of the situation. Um, this is the last picture, the one from which uh, Jackson put on the left side. 
it's at the end of the situation. Everybody was smiling, but it was because uh, we think, we thought that we have done a good job considering the awful circumstances. Um, ne no one from this uh, picture uh, was prepared for this, no one. Not even us, even if we have uh, tried to, you know, make a lot of um, uh, trainings and work a lot with animals, we have ne never been prepared to see what the heck happened there. So, um, just to have an idea, uh, we have arrived there at the, in the third day in the morning. So um, the, the, the vessel kind of uh, capsized in su Sunday on the 20, I think it was 24th or something like that, yeah. Um, and the first responders, the first responders to the, um, to the, to the vessel were, uh, they kind of took about 30 animals, the one that were on the ship, yeah. And then uh, the second day, uh, things kind of got uh, not that much uh, attention. Media kind of left. Uh, there was no much, in, no more interested. And people, uh, the, the responders over there, took about seven, uh, 17 animals. These 17 animals were exactly the one that you can uh, easily uh, take from the sheep that they were on the somehow uh, in uh, their close vicinity. We have seen this because a lot of um, uh, leaks of video have shown that there is a possibility for other animals to have survived. And this uh, so, uh, animal, animal uh, um, rescue organization really decided to go on the spot. Nobody wanted us there. Nobody wanted anyone, yes? First of all, because we didn't have any, how to put it, they call, we, had, we went to the harbor and they told us, guys, uh, we are not, uh, we cannot let you on the bridge. It's very, uh, it's very unsafe. The, the, the boat is moving. Uh, you, you have to have uh, a lot of, uh, how is it called, um, this um, certificates, it's a sea rescue certificate, this is for humans, not, uh, the, the, their main concern was our own well-being, because if somebody uh, sends anyone on those, uh, in these circumstances, it's a lot of, uh, of risk for themselves. So in the end, after a couple of hours, so this will be on the Tuesday, yes? Uh, Sunday was the, the accident, on Tuesday we arrived at the first tower trying to somehow uh, ask and get on the ship. We took with us a lot of equipment, uh, tarps, uh, pulleys, ropes, the medical kit, whatever we had and we, we, we used normally in uh, animal rescues. Uh, and after a while we somehow, uh, after presenting a lot of uh, CVs, a lot of uh, papers that we are entitled, we, we, we are able to have done that trainings and so on and so forth. They somehow, okay, guys, we let you with the firefighters. Uh, they are called I, uh, GSU, so ISU, uh, this is how they are called in Romania. Um, you can go with them, but only to look at the ship and uh, see that there are no more uh, live animals on the ship with them, but should, you, you are forbidden to get on the, on the boat. And uh, everybody went with this small ship. We went there, uh, and what happened is that uh, we we were uh, we were sure that something will uh, it, it was not it was not uh, it was for sure there were animals in the boat leaving. There was impossible that you can find in those, those many many animals in this this big uh, ship. For sure there were chambers, there were uh, decks where animals should have been alive. And I took it upon myself. I jumped on the boat even if I was forbidden, and saw several of those animals. And they were alive. They were uh, really, you know, standing on corpses. Uh, many of them, uh, they were dying and suffering and agonizing. It was really, really uh, awful. And what we have done, actually, in that moment, we have uh, also uh, put a video on the internet saying, asking, please allow us to rescue those animals. Everybody forbidden it to, to do this. Everybody was screaming, get out of the ship. It's not secure. Please get out of the ship. Of course, uh, after a while, uh, it got, uh, we got a little bit frustrated. It was not the best uh, scenario. We knew that uh, we had the capacity and we kind of thought that we can improvise some sort of a mechanism to take the animals out of the ship, but we were always on constant demand to get out of the ship. Uh, in the end, uh, the good thing is that one of the firefighters, the, 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 the team of the firefighters that went with us on the ship, on the barge, the one that was uh, supporting the, the big ship, um, those guys over there, uh, they were only on a surveillance uh, job. They didn't have any equipment, they didn't have anything with them. They were just analyzing the situation. But fortunately, we took the uh, equipment uh, with us and we presented to those guys, guys, please help us 
uh, rescue as many animals as possible because it's doable, we have seen it. And of course, you know, firefighters, when they see, they see a civilian begging them to rescue animals, they kind of melt it down somehow and then they realize that we are not crazy, we really are in our minds are sane. And uh, they started to kind of uh, took it upon themselves and they helped us. And from this moment, even if we received from many, many parts of, uh, you know, uh, from the Ministry of uh, Transport, from the Chief of uh, um, uh, Firefighters, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, summations, you know, get, get out of the ship. Somehow, the, the, one of the commanders of the firefighters uh, listened to us and they say, okay, whatever, it happens, what it happens, it happens. I will take it upon myself. Even if uh, I got fired, I will try to rescue those animals. Every animal uh, life is uh, important. Every, every, every life is important. Let's see how we do it. And then somehow they listened to us, which it's really funny, you know, for, especially for a firefighter to listen to a civilian. Uh, and, um, and we started to put uh, into action this, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, sort of pulleys and tarps to pull the animals out. I think you can uh, show a little bit what happened these days. So Jackson, can you please uh, press? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's four minutes long and you will see slowly uh, how it works. I hope it's gonna... Okay. Okay, so as you see uh, here, um, you see the, the boat is a little bit uh, shaky, but I hope it's gonna, you can have an idea. They tried, this is actually, it's uh, in the third day. So it's, the movie is not uh, very uh, chronologically well, but you have seen that how we decided uh, to, to join together um, and try to pull the animals from the boat and send them uh, somehow, uh, pull them down. Most of the animals were anesthetized by me. Some of them, they were very agonizing. Uh, we, we, there was no need to anesthetize them. So we just uh, pulled them down and without any problems. Uh, they were very heavy. But the second day, second day was the most difficult. So you, some images here you will see from the most difficult chamber ever because it was not ventilated. It was not uh, at all. Um, uh, they didn't have any uh, light at all. And after a while, you really got a lot, a lot of really, it was very, very hard to work there. Yeah, it, uh, nobody wanted to enter there because either they were, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more slim and I managed to kind of uh, make my way through them. But you will see here that we actually on the floor of the, if you know, on the lower side, it's the water with a lot of dead carcasses, a lot of dead animals, which we actually, which I actually, had to use them as a barge to move from one animal to the other, to see where it's uh, some sort of an animal, if, if there's an animal alive and how to, uh, how to take it from there. And we somehow made a lot of systems, how to put a harness on the animals and move them from actually from 20, 30 meters from that chamber up to the exit of the, um, of the um, you know, uh, exit of the boat. Uh, um, there, there are a lot of guys here that helped and, uh, you know, after a while, after a couple of hours, uh, not having oxygen proper, not having uh, luminosity, a, a lot of fatigue, uh, it was there, so it was really, really hard physically. Uh, I kind of uh, started to my, also, you know, it was a nightmarish scenario, a lot of corpses there, a lot of blood and, uh, you know, fractures and animals somehow having a very, very strange sound looking, you know, like, I know uh, sheep do not scream. They have kind of, uh, you know, some sort of a squeak. And it's really depressing this to see, you know, thousands of animals dead and then some, some from, you know, corner, an animal starting to, um, uh, uh, to, to make a sound. Uh, it got on me uh, for lack of oxygen and, uh, you know, all the, the, the fatigue and I kind of fainted. And the people there over the, there um, saw me. I also slept in the sleep, slept, slept in the water for a couple of times. Um, they saw that I was not competent enough and they decided for me because I was not, I was just, you know, I think my brain didn't work very well. Um, they asked me, actually, okay, Ovid, you have to stop this. Uh, you, can, you are not able to do it anymore. Let's uh, make a pause. Let's do it uh, one by one. Do not uh, overdo it. And uh, fortunately, uh, there were a lot of professional people over there and they kind of, uh, they could assess the mental status of uh, the team and of everybody and, and myself. 
and uh, no bigger uh, incident happened there. We did have in the third day an issue with uh, the guys actually um, cutting the welders, cutting through the walls of the, um, the ship so they can reach from chambers to chambers. We had an incident that, um, uh, how is it? Uh, the fire of the welders actually got uh, on some bales of hay and we had a little kind of an, in, in a small fire over there. Everybody was taken out. The, um, how is it called? The, uh, the fire was extinguished and we continued to work. But in the third day, this would be the fifth day of the whole intervention, a lot of decay, the corpse, the smell, and a lot of gas is accumulated. And by that uh, bad, day, bad day day, people are considering we cannot continue like this because if we, we use the welding, it might explode, it might be very, very uh, uh, um, dangerous to continue and most probably those animals are not fit anymore in their life if there is anyone alive may maybe they are not feel, uh, fitted to um, uh, you know they cannot be sca saved anymore so it was really really uh, really really hard um, nobody expected it to this nobody was trained specifically for this situation we actually try to use as much as of our knowledge as possible also from the you know jump um, from the um, climbing equipment, also medical equipment. Uh, so what in the end we have done is we, we kind of uh, extracted 254 sheep from which 100 of them uh, really uh, survived. The rest of them, uh, you know, died because of injuries and uh, it was there, they were really, or they had to be euthanized because they were really in a bad situation. Um, the good thing is that after a couple of, uh, after one month, we received from the, um, uh, from the firefighter department a really nice diploma saying that, uh, you know, thanking us um, for our, uh, as a civilian to help uh, with them and that we had a good uh, collaboration and that they were very satisfied of our, um, of our uh, work over there. So in the end, I think it was a good uh, intervention uh, for sure. For sure, we could have done much better. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, things to be improved. But uh, I hopefully will. I hope they will never see this, uh, this type of rescue again in my life. Uh, I think. It's thank you, video. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that everybody can hear and understand that uh, this kind of rescue is incredibly traumatic. Um, uh, I see here there is a question, if I may. Uh, has your team had confined space training? Uh, we did have some, and I also do a lot of caving, so I have a little bit of experience with tight spaces. The yes. issue, yeah, um, what uh, I want to say that uh, we, we have received those oxygen bottles that you put on, uh, you know, uh, to go through like, when, when it's, uh, let's say, a fire or something like that, but it was so tight that we cannot use them uh, properly. Yeah, so uh, even if I was, it was, uh, I, I could not put them on my back and uh, run through the, uh, the, the, you know, from, uh, in, from one space to the other. So, uh, yeah, it was really, really, really very, very hard to work with that. So we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So we'll just continue, um, try to finish this in the next few minutes <laughs> because our time is running out. Um, uh, so it did take us a long time to get custody of the animals before we could um, take care of them. Uh, it went, the animals went back to the veterinary authority and went actually went to the, pers the, the private company that was sending the animals. Um, we do, the lessons learned for us is we recommend that a plan for a long-term holding of rescued livestock is established before the rescue um, because we, we sort of winged it um, because we were more concerned about the animals in the ship. Um, they will stay in our care until a final decision has been made about their future home. Um, so a little bit about the laws. Romania is the largest exporter of live animals in Europe to the Middle East, exporting mostly sheep of a specific breed that is uh, commonly bred in uh, Romania. It's prized as food. The livestock exports are managed by the Romanian National Sanitary Veterinary and Food Safety Authority, Adesive. Um, transportation of live animals are authorized by Anasever, but under a different ministry's um, jurisdiction, which is conflict 
conflicting on both sides. And then European livestock are always seemingly subsidized by the European Union. Um, the food animals are governed by the EU Director General for Health and Food Safety, DG Sante, under the current legislation called the Common Agriculture Policy, which is the CPA. Um, so somebody did mention training. So here's the, here is the training level. So we have a fairly large team um, globally, and so we do take emergency management training um, based on the NARS criteria in the past. Uh, we expanded that to some other things. So technical large animal rescue with uh, Dr. Rebecca jimenez Husted. Um, Swiss water, slack water, high low angle, animal rescue technician with NAVDAG. Um, a few of us are wildland firefighter, red card certified, confined space training with uh, MPS, uh, NFPA, and uh, county emergency management in the past. Um, most of us have uh, advanced human first aid or up to paramedic level training. Um, with different agencies, um, we have FEMA level animal sheltering with Florida SARC, uh, participation in EU OIE national disaster exercises with Bulgaria, Italy, um, quite a few different countries um, for their emergency management along with humanitarian organizations. So lots of training. Um, I think we've seen videos enough. Sorry, I'm just going to move past this because um, we just want to finish this finish this presentation so we can answer your questions. So what will happen now? Um, we have to change the system. It's not just the rescue of these animals, right? Move the system, not the animals. So for pause, um, we had started a campaign a while ago. This was the catalyst that put it in to the front of um, the current momentum. So we currently have a European-wide campaign to end long distance pan transport and live animal transport. Um, at the moment, the campaign is running at full speed. Um, we've achieved many positive milestones. Um, because of the disaster, a EU parliamentary committee of inquiry into live animal transports to review the current uh, CAP um, has been on the agenda and has gone through the German presidency within the EU. The sheep basically embody the tragedy and the cruelty behind long distance transports. We have great support from many people, including um, European parliamentary ministers. Um, what's important for us to look at is uh, we're looking at long term changes to live animal transport um, and better enforcement, which is, was not uh, standardized. So we're going to harmonize, we're looking at the harmonization of regulations across Europe. Um, and there's a immediate update on the CAP. It's called the Farm Farm to Fork Strategy, and it will change a lot of these and start looking at um, climate as well as uh, animal welfare. Um, and animals and disasters need to be recognized within emergency management legislation, which it currently um, is in spirit in some places, but isn't fully enacted or, or fully adopted because there's a gap. Um, there's also a gap with um, not working with civil society organizations like animal welfare groups or animal protection groups that have the skills and the training. So um, the sheep are doing really well. This is a short, short video and I'm clo close to the end of my presentation. As I know the moderators are watching the clock. So this was six months ago. Um, here are the sheep um, in summer in Romania, um, they were allowed to finally graze. Um, just remember, these animals are only about a year, year and a half. They've only lived in feedlots. It wasn't until they came to uh, the care in Romania that they were actually able to see actual vegetation, uh, be outdoors, have space. These things are always lacking um, because the intensity of the, the kind of farming that they're under. So. Just a nice cute video of where the sheep are today. Um, we do have quite a few lambs. Um, there were quite a few females that were pregnant by the time we got them. When we calculated from the date of the birth of the lamb, they were pregnant before the transport. So, um, and they would have definitely birthed during the transport. 
So this is where they are now. Um, well, it doesn't look like this right now because it's winter, uh, but that was during Corona. And uh, yeah, challenges that last year was uh, 180 sheep. Um, we hope that these sheep will serve as ambassadors for many, many other animals about long distance live animal transports that need to stop. Um, so we, we, we need your support to do this. Um, so a little bit about our organizations. Um, one is Four Paws and the other one is ARCA. Um, our information is available online. You can always find us and you can definitely reach out to us and email us with any of your additional questions if we don't answer it here today. I'd like to take some time to, uh, to recognize some special people. Um, the ISU in Constanta, the Port of Constanta, and their first responders, which includes the firefighters and the Pomeri, um, the Ro Romanian Ana Serve, uh, Cookie and Dr. Florian of ARCA, who are in the video um, with uh, Dr. Roshu, uh, Rebecca, who's here, John, Norm, Leah, who provided us training from NAVDAG, Bud and Kanzi at Florida Sark, um, my colleagues at Four Paws, at CC Horses uh, Fan, which is um, Farm Animal Nutrition, our science unit and our European policy office. And a special thank you to, of course, Steve Glacy and the GADMAC committee and the fellow speakers and the supporters in Romania who helped us make this a big deal in the media because it was there, then it was gone, and then it came back. So this would not have happened without all of these people recognizing the importance of animals and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Wow, that's somewhat sort of sobering to see, um, you know, the, the sheer scale of that. And, and um, you know, I think we have to really acknowledge the hard work that um, your organisations <coughs> have done, and in particular those um, video and, and you and your colleagues on the on the ground dealing with the aftermath um, of that. So. I'm sure there's a number of things that have come out from that event. It's great to see a number of those inquiries and some of those sort of policy discussions in terms of hopefully to, to change some of the, the practices. Um, a few questions have come through. Um, what, would, what was going to be the plan if you hadn't intervened? What was going to happen with, with all those, those sort of sheep on board? Can, can you repeat the question, please? I didn't understand exactly. Oh, sorry. What was the plan for the authorities, the, the, the shipping companies, et cetera, if, if you and your coalition of animal rescue responders didn't respond? What, what was going to happen to all those sheep if you hadn't turned up? I mean, it was pretty much okay, let them die and the process of uh, decarcassing the whole ship and then uh, taking the, the ship to the, the shore. So it will have taken a couple of days until probably, the, I mean, for sure they would have died uh, because of hunger and stress and so on and so on. And uh, uh, you know, the carcass decomposing and all these uh, uh, gases over there. And then uh, they will take their time because it took, I think, uh, until February, it took uh, all the decarcassing, so taking all the animals out of the ship, the dead animals, and then taking to the ship to the shore for whatever they wanted to do with the ship. So, yeah, I mean, uh, life it, in those circumstances doesn't last too much. So uh, waiting was the, no, the best approach for them. But one, I, I didn't mention something. Uh, there, there is no protocol in Romania to handle something like this. That's why the fire department were very reluctant to work on this scenario. Okay, they would have worked, it, worked for humans. They actually saved the human that uh, fell from the barge and then they took it outside. It was very, very okay with the human, but for the animals, they don't have any protocols. And that was the most important thing that uh, we have. We try to actually present to the fire department, guys, we have to work on protocols, even you know, either you, you manage it with the help of an organization that it's uh, interested in animals or you have to develop it, develop it by yourself because this thing can happen and you are not prepared because they were not prepared for this. They didn't, I mean, they could do it. You know, you know it was not uh, science fiction. It was not uh, uh, nuclear uh, fusion there, but, um, you know, they, they didn't have it on paper. And this means a lot of uh, issues 
administrative administrative issues that they had to you know overtake. And we were very lucky that, that there were really good firefighters and the commander over there on the board said, okay, let's let's have those guys because they are not that crazy and maybe we can save a life. Firefighters in Romania, they do a lot of animal rescues, but not in these circumstances. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. did you bring any, any specific equipment which helped uh, to indicate to the firefighters that you were actually trained and yeah. equipped to, to deal with this? As I said, we were also very lucky. We were very lucky also because uh, I just happened to take, even if they, uh, the harbor sent us to just to do a, a surveillance or to you know, evaluate the situation, I just took by, I kind of always to take it with me, the bag with ropes and a tarp and uh, some pulleys and uh, so on, uh, and and uh, you know my medical kit, which I always take with me in case something bad happens. I didn't expect to use it. I just took it with me, and I was very. We were very lucky that in the team of the firefighter, there were climber, climbers, firefighters, and those two guys. I always always remember that when they saw me, like presenting to them, and you know showing that we know what we do. You know, not professional, super professional, but we know how to manage a pulley. They say, okay, we will take the, the care of this. You just go to the animal and take the animal and we will manage the, the tarps and the pulleys. And the next day, they really brought their own specific equipment and they really did a great job. So the fact that we presented in the beginning, the, a chance, a real chance, a technical possibility for this situation actually encouraged them uh, and put some sort of uh, trust in us that we try to do a, a professional thing there. And a uh, question here is, do you think there was a deliberate attempt by authorities to hush the tragedy of this, this accident? I'm not the person to ask this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. So, <laughs> so I can answer that question to Jennifer. Um, so the Guardian in the UK did discover not um, speak about this accident or at least um, it was in the news and it kind of went away before um, Four Paws made us think about it and then they came back um, and because there were animals and then the story got momentum um, so there was that intent it seems to to quiet the story um, and then they got traction so so that's a challenge and the, and the video footage that you took um, from the But you can find it in the Guardian. And I'm I'd sorry, imagine Steve. the That's right. I, I'd imagine the video footage that was taken was it was a quite a significant catalyst to get um, to bring attention to the issue. It was. Um, it was the leaked footage from the second or the third day that started to help bring momentum that animals were still alive, standing or buried under other dead animals or just just sitting there. Um, the guys, I mean, I was on, it was, um, so they didn't really want non-Romanians there. Um, they didn't want this to be exposed, so I wasn't able to travel there. So managing this from afar and doing mostly incident management um, with the reporting, um, with the guys on the ground, what we were, we eventually went there, but what we learned was um, there's a lot of pride. There's also a lot of uh, carefulness with how they were proceeding. Um, one is they weren't sure of our credentials. The guys were able to present their credentials. Um, and even after that, they were unsure about allowing people to know what was happening. Absolutely. Um, so another question here is, um, how will the improvements in livestock transportation be aligned to shipping vessels' current requirements only to conform to the port of origin ruling? Uh, how will this be monitored, audited, or enforced? Um, so those are details that my colleagues would actually have to do because they're working on the policy end. What I can say is, to, to harmonize across the EU a single standard um, for what is acceptable, what is an acceptable vessel for transport, um, inspections of those vessels to match um, 
what is actually submitted for approval um, and um, having the sign off from the veterinary authorities of the exact amount of animals that are supposed to be on a vessel. So here's what's not in the presentation that I can share a little bit of. When the salvage company came to right the ship, um, they used straps, they roll it, and the strap snapped. Something was wrong. They sent divers in. The divers first checked the straps, checked the weight, um, looked at the blueprints, looked at the ship. The ship's blueprints and the ship itself did not match. There were additional compartments. And in those compartments were additional carcasses. There were no counts of those animals, unfortunately, but it was um, it was heavier than it should have been. There were additional animals on the transport. Um, the transport also has other issues that we discovered that was not in the presentation because it's supposed to go to a destination with a buyer. The buyer was might have been a dummy company. And what, the, what happens is once the sh subsidized animals at about 25, 20 to 25 euros a head of sheep is sold for about 300 euros a head in the Middle East into countries that potentially are we have an embargo with. So they sort of go around and drop animals off as they go. So whatever animals are left are sometimes just probably thrown off the ship, honestly. Um, but they sell what they can along the way, even to wherever they want. The buyer on the other end is just a dummy company, just to say that there's somebody buying some of them. And then they sort of drop animals off along the way. And they have contacts all the way through. Um, so it's a huge question of a black market. Um, so that is all fed into the management of transport, um, as well as the animal welfare, um, and huge other issues. So this is not just about the, the animal welfare agencies within government departments or the, the, the agricultural departments. This is also about their, their, maritime, their maritime regulators making sure that the vessels are fit. Um, as you say, there was the, I saw in one news article that, as you say, there was additional compartments and floors yeah. um, that probably would have, may have led to the instability of the vehicle, not of, the, of the vessel. Um, yeah. So maritime regulators also probably have a, a role to play in terms of mitigation. There is. So that's why the, they're working on what responsibility belongs to sort of the maritime or the transport ministries and then what is for the veterinary authorities. And that is that was not as clear before, but if we harmonize all of that and then there's a proper system for all countries within the EU, then that will standardize and harmonize and come down the line. Um, and then there's real questions as to if we're allowing sales to non-EU countries of live animals, and that's currently being debated, as well as the long distance transport of animals within the EU, if that should be, you know, what is the maximum allowable transport times? And what about insurance? Are, are, the, are the stock insured in any way or, or not? I'm just sort of thinking of that in terms of sometimes insurance can drive um, uh, the, the, the owners, I suppose, of those animals to essentially write them off as opposed to have any investment to, to save them because if they get paid out, it's just seen as a business loss. Yes, yeah, so insurance is a massive component. So we are working um, hand in hand with uh, insurance uh, or reinsurance companies as well as international finance institutions to look at the sustainability of these actions um, because this is all tied to long-term bigger picture scope um, of what should the business look like um, and where can we take a stand and improve our current processes um, so insurance is part of the game that we're playing with um, the What's interesting is because a lot of these animals um, or crops or everything, um, uh, agriculture within the EU is subsidized. So there's taxpayer money going into this. So there is some questions as to, you know, what is your, your tax dollars going towards? Um, so citizens are up at arms. Um, insurance is part of this because 
there are some insurance schemes in Europe, but it's not in every country. Most of the insurance in Europe is actually taken on by the EU. Hmm. Um, so we're working through the EU, and that's why the legislation for the CAP and the farm to fork strategy would make a lot of those changes of where we invest, how we invest, and how that should look. Well answered. Um, so probably our last question is, was there any liability for the ship owner or the ability to share costs for the rescue and the care of the sheep associated with this, this event? Um, to the owner of the, so there was the owner of the animals and then there's the owner of the ship. <laughs> sure. Two different entities. Um, there was almost no liability for the sheep seller uh, or the sheep buyer. Um, and there was minimal uh, liability for the ship owner. So the ship owner, what we understand is um, to take that ship out of port, it, the port authority had recommended a their tugboat with their driver to take the ship out into open water so they can continue their journey. They decided that they did not wish to to save funds and they just had their own captain captain it out without knowing the uh, topography and in doing so run on run aground. Um, and that's why the salvage company, which was also recommended that they have a different salvage company, they also did not take that recommendation, used their own salvage company, and that salvage company exposed them to the risk of um, different weights of the actual ship that didn't match. So the equipment they had didn't, uh, weren't, wasn't able to help salvage. So, um, <laughs> so a, a bit of planning can go a long way. A bit of planning goes a long way, yes. Um, so the only risk there went back to government because there was questions of um, graft. Brilliant. And uh, maybe just the, at the final wrap up is maybe going back to you, a video is around, um, were there any sort of distinct moments or memories you have during that, that response being there that really stands out for you thinking back? Okay, so I think I have a couple of them. First of all, um, first one would be the moment that we approach the harbor, the port, and actually trying to convince the people to allow us on the boat. That was the first one, yeah. And somehow we managed. I don't know how, but we managed. There was there, you know, they they didn't. Nobody, I think, nobody wanted this. At least from the people that I uh, run into, nobody wanted this disaster. The second was the moment that uh, you know uh, the fire uh, authority, the, the firefighters uh, actually uh, somehow switch from uh, those crazy animal welfareists to those people that actually might know what they are doing. Uh, of course, uh, that was the most important moment because that kind of dri drove, I mean, yeah, uh, open the, all the rescue opportunity, the chance to rescue those animals. And uh, yeah, of course, the fact that, I mean, it was awful when we entered the, those chambers, that was just really, 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 it was really, really bad, yeah. Um, but also the, the last moment would be, would be when everybody approached ourselves and we were kind of like, uh, you know, uh, appreciating our work and everybody had good things to say about the other people. So it was, it was really very kind of a family. We kept connection the, all this time and it was really, Somehow we never knew, I don't know even their names by now, but somehow we kind of were connecting in that moment and it was, uh, it was a good uh, moment for everybody. Well, what a, what a great job and courageous job yeah. that, and difficult job that you, the video, did with you, all your colleagues uh, with your NGO in Romania. And um, I'm sure the, the support and uh, leadership also provided by Jackson uh, back at Four yep. Paws, um, just shows really that like to thank. <laughs> that collaboration, that support and expertise um, have certainly highlighted this issue to the world and hopefully uh, there will be some lessons from events like this to help mitigate the future events. So on behalf of GADMAC and the organising committee, uh, we'd like to thank you both very much uh, for joining us at the inaugural GADMAC and for such an insightful 
and, and challenging presentation. And uh, we thank you very much uh, for your time and presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was a, certainly an um, insightful presentation and uh, reminds us why we're all here and why planning is so important. And that planning and coordination is key. And on that theme, we end today, but our first session tomorrow morning, day six, is with Dr. Minden Buswell, who's the Vice President uh, of NASAP, the National Alliance of State Animal and Agricultural Emergency Programs in the US. And she's gonna be talking about that framework, how it's been established and operating with great success within the US. So again, thank you our speakers. Thank you all for joining us here at GABMAC and we look forward to seeing you at our next presentation. Thank you very much.